reading your reports and articles outlining the findings uh, of this work that you were referring to, Carlos, I was really struck by what uh, you said in the reports about the role of governments in soft law programs, in, in all of those that are reviewed. Uh, and it's, it's often, you know, soft law is often perceived to be opposite to government regulation. But in fact, you found that governments were the primary participant in most of this, followed by industry and nonprofit. What is this telling us? Yeah, as, as Gary mentioned earlier, uh, soft law is generally viewed by some individuals or some organizations as self-regulation, private sector self-regulation. What we found is that government entities at all levels of government, national, provincial, state, or local use soft law programs to guide uh, stakeholders, either to guide stakeholders or to inform them about their expectations. There's several reasons why government use this. It's either to anticipate hard law, to let them know that hard law is coming, or to provide, provide this guidance as to what are the expectations that, are, that, are, that uh, an entity has. Now, the vast majority of our programs, or at least the majority, about 40 something percent are created by government institutions. But it's really interesting to find that there are regional differences. And the most interesting one is differences, difference between the United States and Europe. In the United States, you can see that there's um, equity in participation between government, private sector, and nonprofits. It's about 20 something percent for each sector, and then the rest is multi stakeholder programs. In Europe, that is completely different. What we find is that the vast majority of programs are government led, and, this is, and we explain this by the philosophy of how these two regions work. Europe works a little bit more in the precautionary principle approach where government has a more active approach. We've seen this in previous technologies such as GDPR. And the US is more hands-off. Uh, the United States, as you know, doesn't have many uh, federal statutes on issues that Europe does, such as privacy and data that is left to particular sectors such as uh, fair housing or other areas where data has to be used in particular ways or individuals below the ages of 13. And several states have created biometric laws, Illinois, uh, Texas, California, but the United States is more hands-off than Europe in that respect. And that's why um, what, what we see in the regional differences, and yes, you're right, and as Gary mentioned, well, government is the largest participant of all, of all entities in the creation of self law, which also surprised us. Gary, from your side? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, again, it's a real diverse mix of, of, of programs, right? That uh, some are industry programs, uh, some are individual companies, some are NGOs leading the way, but uh, many of them, the government is like playing a key role. I sort of got tuned into this when I was working on nanotech about 15 years ago, we had a meeting off the record under, um, you know, Chatham House rules with all the federal agencies in the United States to talk about nanotech regulation and the role of hard versus soft law. And I was really surprised at that meeting where every single agency, I think we had several federal agencies all said in the short term, we're going to have to rely on soft law. That's the only thing we're going to have for us to adopt regulations. We have to have definitions. We have to have measurement methods. We have to have all these different things in place. And it's going to take us 10 years to get there. So for the next decade, we're going to be primarily relying on soft law with existing regulation to govern this technology. And that really was a wake up call to me because it made me realize that this is a really important part of the ecosystem for governance of emerging technologies. We can't just sort of just let it go on its own. It's going to be carrying a lot of the, the water for uh, assuring technologies are trying to be used in a responsible way. And now we get to AI we see the exact same thing. It's come very quickly. There's a lot of different applications, a lot of players developing, and we're already starting to see concerns and issues arise about biased algorithms, about uh, unsafe systems and so on, unreliable systems. Um, and so uh, how do we govern those? Eventually we're gonna have more and more hard law government regulation. We're not against that. That's you know important part of the, the ecosystem again, but that takes time and it's gonna usually be adopted incrementally steps at a time. Maybe in the United States, we'd start with facial recognition, but it's unlikely we're gonna have you know, the AI regulatory statute or the AI regulatory agency. People propose those type of things, but they never actually get adopted. We've seen it through a whole series of technologies now, that same pattern of, of a, basically a more of an evolution rather than some revolutionary new regulatory system. Europe's a little bit different. They put in place, you know, proposed regulations, but it's going to be two or three years before those are binding. 
you know, there's a lead time, it has to be finalized. Uh, and even when it is, it does incorporate a lot of soft law within it. So even in the European system, which does have a greater emphasis on government regulation, we're still gonna see soft law playing a key role. So one of the issues is how do these two things dance together? How does soft law and hard law interact? When is the right time to rely on soft law? When is the right time to rely on a hard law? How does that change over time? Can soft law morph into hard law with experience? Uh, the interaction between these two types of, of governance are really critical, but they're both uh, essential for, I think, responsible governance of a technology. Mm -hmm.